Okay, well, good morning. Uh, thanks to everyone who came out uh, uh, on an early Wednesday morning to talk about Zimbabwe. Uh, my name is Judd Devermont. I am the director of the Africa program here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. And it's my pleasure to co-host this event today with Kimberly Flowers, who is the director here for the Humanitarian Agenda and the Global Food Security Project. Today's topic, Zimbabwe's food crisis, is a terribly important one. Uh, Kimberly and I believe it's really imperative to elevate uh, what is right now happening in Zimbabwe. And I'll point out just three reasons why this is a significant and important conversation. First, the food crisis is unfolding at a time when, in my opinion, international attention on Zimbabwe has gone from 100 to close to zero. Um, we had this enthusiasm and wonderment about the fall of Robert Mugabe in November of 2017. We shifted to a disappointment about the election, the violence around it. And now we're at a place where Zimbabwe has a very hard time getting international attention amongst foreign policy circles. And so the conversation about its political trajectory, its economic trajectory, it's hard to get it on the front pages and in the conversations about Africa. So it's incredibly important to us to bring Zimbabwe back on the map. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this discussion today. Two, the food crisis is a re combination of factors, both the economic stressors, excuse me, the environmental stressors, but also the poor monetary and fiscal policies of the current government. And I'm gonna defer to our esteemed panelists to kind of explain more, but I think this combination, particularly the hyperinflation and other issues makes it worthy of our attention. Third, this is not just a rural food crisis. This is an urban problem and it cuts across the economic spectrum. My program is starting, starting some work right now on Africa's growing urban populations, and we want to press ever so gently, uh, but we want to press uh, U.S. government and other stakeholders to really put more time and attention and resources in seizing opportunities and addressing the challenges in Africa's urban environments. As the World Bank said in 2013, urbanization is the single most important transformation that the Africana will undergo uh, this century. The region will not only be 50% urban by 2030, but 20% of the world's urban population will be in Africa by 2050. So it is really important to look at both uh, the food crisis, the drivers, but also this rural-urban divide and understanding what are the tools that we need uh, to develop to measure urban poverty and urban food insecurity, what are the tools and the resources that we need to apply to respond to it. So um, this is, in, in short, the three reasons why we really wanted to have this conversation. But you didn't come here for me, you came here for our esteemed panelists. And before I hand it over to Kimberly uh, to moderate, it is my great pleasure uh, to invite uh, Ambassador Matt Harrington uh, to do a keynote speech. We're really fortunate to have Matt here. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Southern uh, Africa and Public Diplomacy. He was Ambassador to Lesotho, served in Ghana, served in Namibia, served in, Ga in, in Zimbabwe. But I had the pleasure of meeting Matt uh, in 2005 when he was the DCM in Charge in Togo. And I was impressed uh, with Matt's expertise and his poise um, and his um, just thoughtfulness. So I think he's one of our finest foreign service officers, and I'm really excited that he's here today to share his views. So Matt, thank you so much. Good morning. Judd, thank you for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here uh, and delighted to see some familiar faces in the audience today. So thank you for coming. A big thanks to Judd and to Kimberly and their teams for organizing what will be uh, a discussion of a very important topic that deserves attention. So thank you to those teams for doing that. Uh, Judd asked me if I would, before the panel, share a few thoughts on recent developments in Zimbabwe from the U.S. government perspective and to talk a little bit about where we see the U.S.-Zimbabwe relationship today. So I will begin with November, 20, in, with November 2017 with the departure of Robert Mugabe from office after nearly four decades in power. His exit from the scene provided a real opportunity uh, for Zimbabwe to set itself on a very different path. After 40 years of human rights abuses, 
catastrophic economic mismanagement, widespread corruption, and deeply flawed elections. We welcomed the change in rhetoric when President Imagagwa assumed office. He pledged his commitment to implement profound political and economic reforms and said Zimbabwe was open for business. And that's a refrain uh, that we heard from the president and from many of his senior officials in every meeting uh, that we had. Then all eyes turn to the July 2018 presidential election, the first since the country's independence when Robert Mugabe was not on the ballot. I was in Harare several weeks before that election. I heard from human rights groups that there was less violence than they had seen in previous elections. And I was there when ZBC, the, the government-owned television station, live streamed Nelson Chamisa's unveiling of the opposition manifesto. And that was all, that was all positive. In the end, I would say the election was uh, better than previous elections in Zimbabwe, but it was still very far from a level playing field. Unfortunately, any goodwill from the international community that might have been generated by an improved election process dissipated as a result of several problematic, problematic developments which Judd referred to. The use of deadly force by the army on August 1st in response to protests and the targeting of opposition supporters by uh, security forces throughout most of the month of August of last year. In addition, in January and February, the Army launched a sustained crackdown on citizens in response uh, to their protests of fuel price increases. We have heard credible reports that 13 people were killed and many more were beaten and some shockingly even raped. I think that is the first time in the many, many years that I've been following Zimbabwe that we heard reports of rape being used as a, as a tool by security forces, and that was very disturbing. And during this troubling period, the government shut off access to the internet, which is also not a good sign. The use of state-sanctioned violence against civil society, journalists, opposition members, and union leaders will be familiar to longtime Zimbabwe watchers, and it has undercut claims that the country is on a new path. It is important, though, to acknowledge that we've seen some positive steps. There is a new, more technocratic cabinet in place, and there's been some movement on economic reforms. The recent agreement between the government and the IMF on a staff monitored program is a, is, a, is a good step forward from our perspective. I want to underscore, though, that the success of Zimbabwe's economic reforms is inextricably linked to the implementation of profound political change. And we are not seeing much progress on the latter. The government is saying some of the right things, but it is falling short when it comes to concrete actions. There are some steps the government could take to demonstrate it is serious about improving rule of law and respect for human rights in Zimbabwe. It could repeal the Public Order and Security Act and the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act, two laws long emblematic of a repressive regime. It could stop using the army to harass and intimidate citizens who exercise their fundamental right to free speech. And it could hold accountable those members of the security forces who have abused their fellow citizens. Those simple actions would send a strong signal to Zimbabweans and the international community that Zimbabwe is uh, on a very different path and genuinely committed to embracing democratic institutions and values and to becoming a more responsible member of the international community. And not one of those steps, I will point out, requires outside assistance. The government could take any one of them today. The fact that it has chosen not to do so raises questions about the genuineness of its commitment to putting the country on a much different trajectory. The 2018 version of the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act, which most of us know as ZADERA, clearly lays out the reforms we need to see in order to have a normalized relationship with Zimbabwe. Those include restoration of the rule of law, an equitable and transparent land reform process, and a military and police force that are subordinate to the civilian government. We welcome a better relationship with Zimbabwe, but the ball is very much in the government of Zimbabwe's court. If there is real, concrete progress in the areas laid out in the Zadera legislation, Zimbabwe will find a committed partner in the United States. In the meantime, we will continue as we always have to respond to the needs of ordinary Zimbabweans. And I just wanted to give you a few figures. 
Since 2008, USAID has provided more than 700 million US dollars in humanitarian assistance to the people of Zimbabwe for food and disaster assistance. And we have been at the forefront of the fight against HIV AIDS in Zimbabwe, investing more than $850 million over the past decade through the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or better known as PEPFAR. In addition, this year alone, we have already provided $2.6 million to address immediate food, shelter, and agriculture needs uh, resulting from the floods caused by the cyclone. And we are very concerned, as the panel will talk about uh, this morning, that an estimated four and a half million Zimbabweans are currently facing food shortfalls, 2.9 million of those in rural areas. My understanding is that that situation is expected to worsen over the coming year, exacerbated by severe drought and an ongoing economic crisis. And I know we'll hear from experts on the panel shortly about what the food crisis looks like and how the international community is, is poised to respond. Let me just conclude here by, by emphasizing that no matter what the challenges are in the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and Zimbabwe, we will always be prepared to respond to the humanitarian needs of ordinary Zimbabweans. We always have, and we will, we will do that going forward. So with those few remarks, let me say thanks very much for inviting me to join you today, and uh, hope the conversation today is, is a good and vigorous one. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Harrington, for your remarks. We, we appreciate your time this morning. I, I first want to um, just give thanks to my colleague, Judd, for bringing this to my attention, too. I mean, I, I've done a lot of work in Zimbabwe. I've been leading, I mean, a lot of work in, in Africa and been leading our food security work here for the last four years. But I, I really want to admit that when Judd first came to me and said, do you know what's happening in Zimbabwe? I was like, eh. It's, it's bad, but it's, there's a lot of worse crisis happening elsewhere. But I said, let me, let me talk to some people and see whether this is really something that we should put our energy towards. And so my first call was to FuseNet, as it often is. And as I talked to other people, including people on this panel, um, I realized that, yes, what's happening in Zimbabwe absolutely needs to um, be elevated in terms of there needs to be more awareness. Um, there is definitely the likelihood that things could get worse. And so I'm really grateful that we were able to have this opportunity and platform to talk about that. I'm also very grateful that we have two of our speakers that flew from Zimbabwe for this discussion. Both Jason and Ashok um, flew here just to spend a few days so that we were able to talk about this. I also want to point out, it may not be in their bios, but of all of our speakers today, we have three of us who are returned Peace Corps volunteers. We have Ambassador Harrington, Jason, Peter, and myself. So it's also a good reminder that sometimes Peace Corps is a great start to a career in this field. Um, I'm going to do very quick introductions of our panel. Um, you have their bios in your hands, but I, I, I want to really get started quickly. Um, first is, is Jason Taylor. Uh, Jason is, the, is a humanitarian response, food security, and resilience expert. He's here today representing the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. But for the last almost four years, he's been living in Zimbabwe, and he's the head of the Office of Humanitarian Assistance and Resilience. Um, he has a lot of experience with complex emergencies, social safety nets, and disaster risk, risk management. Um, I also noticed that you lived in Ethiopia, which I did as well. We have a lot in common. Um, so Peter. Peter is next. Um, Peter is currently the acting deputy chief of party for the Famine Early Warning System Network, or FUSENET. Those in our audience who are in the food security space know that acronym well. Those not, if you ever need any sort of objective analysis on what's happening in the world, including, including forward looking at what the, the food security needs will be, um, FUSENET is the place to go. They produce these kinds of reports for 30 six um, of the world's most food insecure countries. And I'll say of all the emails that I get, um, FuseNet's emails are the ones that I actually look at um, because their analysis is what I need to stay on top of to look at global trends. And last but far from not least is Ashok. And Ashok, um, sorry, I'm looking, I only have your first name. Chavra, say your last name for me. Chakravati. 
Thank you. That way I won't say it incorrectly. Um, Ashok is, is many things. He is an institutional economist. That's a new phrase for me to learn. He's an author. He's an independent analyst and here today as an independent analyst. He's also the co-founder of the Roundtable of Economists in Zimbabwe. Um, he has worked at senior levels in the government of Zimbabwe for many years, including working in the office of the president. But for the last four decades, he has worked throughout Africa advising UN agencies and international donors. So we're really grateful that he can bring that country level perspective. So Jason, let's start with you. Um, as the ambassador said, we know that you're going to help us lay out the humanitarian kind of context, what's happening on the ground right now, and then what is the U.S. government doing about it? Thank you very much, and thank you for all coming today. I, I think uh, the focus of today's panel is enormously important for Zimbabwe. I think we're at a critical time for the country, and so the more people who are paying attention to it, uh, the better. So to get started, as the, the ambassador has said, we're seeing increased humanitarian needs in Zimbabwe, uh, which are tied to flood, drought, macroeconomic decline, or some combination of the three. And it's that combination that I think is the most troubling. To break things down a little bit, uh, around 2.5 million people are severely food insecure as a result of drought. There are more food insecure people in Zimbabwe than that, but the subset that is considered in need of humanitarian assistance of some form uh, is 2.9 million people. Meanwhile, in urban areas, an estimated 1.5 million people are categorized as food insecure. So adding those numbers together, that's, around, that's over 26% of the entire population of Zimbabwe. Meanwhile, we have, uh, have 270,000 who are cyclone affected. Um, by that I mean they've had their livelihoods severely disrupted or destroyed entirely uh, by floodwaters and also have had their homes uh, compromised. While that's a relatively small number of the overall total, I think I should point out that those needs are acute right now. And so I, I think it's, it's something that bears attention and, and response. Looking ahead, we see these needs increasing, and there are a couple of different reasons for that. The first is related to climate shock. As has been mentioned, uh, this year was not a good year climatically for Zimbabwe. We had floods in one part of the country, but in the majority of the other, we had severe periods of drought. In some parts of Zimbabwe, those periods of drought were the worst on record, the worst in 40 years or more. As a result, informal estimates by USDA predict that we could be looking at crop reductions of 20 to 30 percent, specifically for maize. Now, that doesn't seem like a huge reduction. That seems like a not great year, but it doesn't scream catastrophe until you consider the next factor that's negatively affecting Zimbabwe, and that is the economic stress. We have experienced in Zimbabwe steady macroeconomic deterioration for a period of years, and things are just now starting to bite. This deterioration is characterized most recently uh, by price spikes, which immediately followed new fiscal and monetary policies uh, implemented by the government last October. And we've seen price increases for imported go goods that are exacerbated by the falling value of the local currency. So just recently, just today actually, um, it's been reported that we're seeing a, a 30 percent increase in the price of maize, a 75 percent increase in the price of bread, um, and inflation is now at 66.8 percent as of March. This is the official rate, and this is up from 59.4 percent in February. So a significant increase in, in one month. Informal estimates are much higher. So no matter how you're looking at it, it's not a good picture. It's not a pretty picture. So this inflation impact is severe for ordinary Zimbabweans who have seen prices rise, but wages aren't keeping up. Even if, even if wages are rising, they're not competing with the increase in prices that we're seeing. And we're seeing this impacted in the rural areas as farmers struggle to source and procure inputs so they can, so they can plant. Um, and they're facing reduced yields and reduced casual labor opportunities. Most smallholder farmers, and the majority of farmers in Zimbabwe are smallholder farmers, they, don't, they rely on a combination of their own production and casual labor opportunities in order to meet their economic needs. And we're seeing declines in both of those. In a given year, you might rely on one over the other. Neither of those options are reliable in the rural areas, and this is very worrying. Meanwhile, in the urban areas, we're seeing the level of food insecure reach the highest ever recorded for Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has been doing periodic um, urban vulnerability assessments. There have been six done since 2003. 
current levels are the highest of any of them. And that includes hyperinflation years. And so this is, this is something that is almost a silent crisis because it's, it's almost growing while you're unaware of it. Um, the proportion of households in a shared dwelling in urban areas, according to the most recent estimates, um, is growing. This is a function of the deteriorating economy. People are having trouble paying for their rent. And as a result, they're pooling their resources and living closer together. This increases the transmission of things like typhoid and cholera. Uh, this has public safety and public health impacts. Um, and we're also seeing the increased proportion of the income spent on food. So in 2016, the average poor household in urban areas spent 28% of their income on food. In 2018, that had risen to 44%. Let me let that sink in a little bit. 28% to 44%. That's a startling increase. And yet, household dietary diversity is worse. So point bluntly, people are spending more on food, but they're eating worse. Now, the dynamics of need, it's important to, to point out. In rural areas, historically, they've been largely climate driven. Rain falls, crops grow. Rain doesn't fall, crops don't grow. And so we've seen needs in the early, rural areas grow with, with drought and then recede with a good year and then grow again. They're somewhat dy dynamic and related to the climate. In urban areas, they're more tied closely to the macroeconomic context. And so you, you, there's been a buffering effect because of regional imports and, and the, the reliance on, on imports like for, for market purchases. But what we've seen is a steady uptick in urban needs as well. And what we have this year is sort of a, a, a mutually reinforcing downward trend where we see a rise in rural needs as a result of climate shocks and a rise in urban needs in terms of macroeconomic shocks, but those shocks are reaching out and touching each other. Rural areas are affected by the macro economy in a more acute way than they had been in the past. The same is true for urban areas and the rural economy. This is not something that affects just the poor, particularly in urban areas. This is, this is an impact that spans socioeconomic strata. We have seen middle class Zimbabweans who are part of the formal economy, and that's a very small portion of the economy in Zimbabwe, who receive regular salaries, they are also having difficulty meeting their daily needs. They're less able to pay for fuel, they're less able to pay for school fees, for food, for health care. And then when you consider the informal social safety nets that support the Zimbabwean community, better off families provide for the, those who are less fortunate. And so these better off families that are pinched by these issues are less able to give their friends and neighbors and members of their social circle, which exacerbates the vulnerability of those people. So if you're, a, if you're a better off family in Zimbabwe, you face a grim choice. You can either give to your neighbor at the expense of your own well-being, or you can keep your resources to maximize your own financial security at the expense of your neighbor's well-being. Either option is right, both options are wrong. And all of this is a function of the context that we're talking about today. In terms of what our expectations are going forward, there are no quick fixes to the economic situation facing Zimbabwe. And the die is cast in terms of what's gonna be harvested this year. And so it is very difficult to imagine a scenario where needs go down between now and a year from now. In fact, I think this is gonna be the base number from which we will grow. Now, in terms of what the US government is doing about it, we're the largest bilateral donor to Zimbabwe, as, as the ambassador has mentioned. We gave, uh, three billion, we've given $3 billion since 1980 uh, for health, food, it's food security initiatives, economic development, and democracy and governance, and over $700 million in the last 10 years alone uh, from the Office of Food for Peace and Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. But despite these long-term goals and investments, we're seeing these humanitarian needs rising, and, and we're responding. We've given 70, $37 million uh, for food assistance this year alone. That's reaching uh, almost 600,000 beneficiaries. We've given $9.7 million in emergency agriculture and water, sanitation, and health um, to complement that, and uh, $2.6 million to date for cyclone relief. We're not alone in this. The government of Zimbabwe is a, is a large humanitarian donor as well, and we work in close collaboration with them on food security initiatives. Uh, European donors in China, as, as well as others, are also part of the effort. 
But the bottom line here, as has been mentioned, we, we have an unwavering commitment to the people of Zimbabwe. We're analyzing and formulating our analysis for the year to come and actively planning uh, for the response. But as has been mentioned, that response and the ability to work our way out of this problem is tied to a lot of the economic and political reforms that has been mentioned by the opening speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, before we meet on to move on to Peter, I actually want to follow up with one point. So. Last week, um, I hosted the FAO and WFP, uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program, authors of the Global Report on Food Crisis, which just came out this month. Um, it just sort of reminds us nothing groundbreaking that's, that's inherently brand new in this, but it reminds us that conflict and, and climate change, but predominantly conflict and insecurity is sort of the main driver for why we have acute food insecurity in the world. Um, of two thirds or 20 or 74, sorry, I'm saying the numbers wrong, two thirds or 74 million people of those that are food insecure are in conflict or insecure situations. The economic stock issue, which is what draws me to, the, the, to me the most interesting element of what's happening in Zimbabwe, were the primary driver of acute food insecurity for only 10 million people last year in 2018, only in Burundi, Sudan, and Zimbabwe. Um, the follow-up question I have related to that is your talk about food price spikes. So when, when Jason says things like, 75% increase in bread prices, or 44% of income is spent on food. For someone like me, that's like an, an automatic red flag because there's huge connections between um, food price spikes, like what we saw in 2007 and 2008, and urban riots. So combining what he's talking about with food price crisis or food prices issues, sorry, that's really hard to say together, um, and, and talking about how this is happening in an urban environment, it, it to me makes me think, okay, are we going to see some not only political, stronger political instability, but perhaps some, some, some form of conflict? Do you have a sense that, that we're headed that direction? Do you think that these price increases are going to lead to any sort of urban riots or conflicts? Is that on your radar? I have to answer this carefully because it would be easy to go way off the rails and have everyone like running for the hills after this. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, Incidents in conflict and incidents of food insecurity are, are intertwined. And when you look at the complex emergencies the world over, the, the two work in tandem. In some cases, one, ca one can cause the other. The causality runs in both directions. I, I think in Zimbabwe, there, there are a couple of components to, the to, this, to this question. Uh, the first is that absolutely it increases the risk of conflict. Um, Any time you're dealing with finite resources that are diminishing and competition for those resources um, and increased desperation, you are dealing with a toxic combination that could manifest in conflict. I think that uh, what I'll mention is, um, on paper, Zimbabwe has many of the characteristics that would result in widespread conflict in fragile contexts, in mm -hmm. fragile country contexts. You, you have um, endemic corruption, you have chronic capacity constraints, you have division within the society, you have transitional moments that have resulted in unmet expectations, and by that I mean the, the ouster of President Mugabe and the, all of the hope that surrounded um, the election that has now been dashed, and so you have that sort of psychological letdown. All of these things um, in other country contexts can contribute to widespread violence or localized violence. That hasn't been the case for Zimbabwe uh, to date, with a few notable exceptions, the one being in, uh, the, the unrest we saw in January in both urban uh, Harare and also Bulawayo, which was uh, in response to overnight fuel price hikes and an increase in um, the taxes related on uh, digital transactions, and people went to the streets, and the government responded forcefully. The ambassador mentioned that. It was a that was a scary time, actually, mm -hmm. uh, to be in Zimbabwe and to be Zimbabwean. Um, I, I think that is uh, that was worrying to all of us because, to date, Zimbabwe, despite the the evidence to the contrary, Zimbabwe has largely avoided um, lo widespread con conflict because of the inherent resilience of Zimbabweans themselves. I think Zimbabwe culture, Zimbabwean culture, and I was a part of a, a conflict assessment that showed this. So I'm just not opining here. I'm, there's, there's something behind what I'm saying. Um, there, there's an inherent peacefulness in Zimbabwean culture. There's a patience for playing the long game, which allows people to tolerate discomfort for a longer period than, than people from other countries may. Um, and finally, there's this 
this mentality of make a plan. Zimbabweans make a plan. They're, they're able to look at a set of circumstances that are maybe diminishing in quality and find a way through it to get to tomorrow. And so that is a, that is a process of strategic sub-optimization. You're, you're able to, to make it through. Um, and these things have largely mitigated the threat of conflict. But what we're seeing, and what we saw in January, is these resiliencies are being pushed to the brink. Things that would have been um, anathema uh, in Zimbabwean culture a few years ago are now something that happened as recently as January. And so this is something we need to track. I don't want, I don't want to um, inflate the threat, but it is some, when you look at the, the contributing factors and you look at recent history, it is a negative trend that we're worried about. Thank you, Jason. Peter, as an expert and analyst, what concerns you about what you're seeing in Zimbabwe? And, and help us think about how this fits in terms of some of the global trends that you also track. Sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting us to speak here today with all the competing crises, food security crises we have going on in the world, we're certainly happy to be part of a, a conversation on Zimbabwe and, and making sure that discussion for Zimbabwe continues. Um, as Kimberly mentioned earlier, FuseNet monitors regularly about 30 countries around the world. We put out regular monthly reporting and analysis that we conduct. But when we take a step back twice a year and do a global comparison of needs, uh, we expand that number of countries out to about 45 countries. And of the 45 countries that we monitor for this global needs comparison, Zimbabwe is currently in the top 10. That seems somewhat daunting considering the top of that list is Yemen, where more than 17 million people are in need of emergency food assistance. But with the update to the IPC analysis, the acute food insecurity analysis earlier this year, the number for Zimbabwe jumped from an estimated two and a half million to about three million people in need of emergency food assistance as we're coming out of the current lean season. When we look at the top 10 countries in the list uh, that FuseNet produces, the primary driver, as Kimberly was indicating earlier, is certainly conflict. That's the primary driver of acute food insecurity in places like Yemen, South Sudan, and Northeast Nigeria, where there's an ongoing risk of famine. But quickly after conflict comes economic factors and weather-related shocks um, as, as also key primary drivers in not only the top 10, but for the whole list of countries that we're monitoring now. Economic drivers are what we call kind of a secondary driver in places like Yemen and South Sudan, where the ongoing conflict is a key impetus for the poor economic conditions seen there. But in places like Zimbabwe, as well as in Sudan and, and many other places across the world, the economic conditions are the primary driver of acute food insecurity in many instances, severely limiting uh, household food access due to the high purchasing uh, the high cost of purchasing food, and as Jason was indicating earlier, household incomes can't keep pace with the high rates of inflation for, for food goods in, in these countries. And then we're also seeing weather-related shocks uh, impacting uh, large areas of the world in 2019. Not only Zimbabwe, but all of Central and Southern Africa experienced a severe drought between October and about April of this year, severely impacting agricultural production across the region and limiting um, households' ability to maintain their, their livestock herd sizes. And shortly after we saw that drought subside and just before the end of the agricultural season, Cyclone Idai passed through uh, northern Mozambique, Malawi, and northern Zimbabwe, which just at the end of the agricultural season wiped out a lot of what uh, residual harvest we were expecting to come in at the end of the year. In 2019, the three million people that are acutely food insecure in Zimbabwe make Zimbabwe actually the second largest acutely food insecure country in the region just after DRC. This is a place that we don't typically see Zimbabwe uh, be in the region, but due to the combined impacts of the poor economic situation, the drought, and the flooding that led to below average agricultural production, we do expect that needs in Zimbabwe that are currently very high will get even higher, as Jason indicated, as we move forward to the end of 2019 and to early 2020, which would be the peak of the agricultural lean season. Households in rural agricultural areas are not meeting their basic food needs with uh, the ongoing harvest that we're seeing now. Typically, households would cultivate in poor rural areas at least three months of agricultural food stocks. We expect that to be much lower this year with the severe reductions in agricultural production. Uh, we were out with USDA when they were in Zimbabwe on their agricultural assessment. As Jason indicated, the, the reduction in production is estimated to be between 20 and 30 percent below average. Uh, in localized areas, particularly in northern areas that were affected by the drought before the cyclone came, there are many areas that didn't harvest anything at all due to the severe drought impacts that, that were seen there. As these households face 
the lean season, which is going to begin this year in about September, October versus December, January, which we would see in a typical year, and their household stocks run out, they're going to face uh, or they're going to move to market purchase to meet their basic food needs, and that's going to be something that's much more difficult this year than it is in a typical year. Uh, we heard how bread and other staple prices are increasing very quickly. Uh, the price of maize is about 70 percent higher than it was last year and about 80 percent higher than it was uh, on five-year average, and the price of, of cooking oil is 130% above average. And these are the, the staple foods, the key staple foods for poor rural households in Zimbabwe, not even a diversified diet, as Jason was indicating before. And what we're seeing now is that in the face of these high uh, prices for households to purchase their basic food needs, not only are they limiting their dietary diversity, but they're also restricting their meal sizes, turning to other uh, coping strategies, reducing consumption of adults to protect the consumption of children that are not only threatening their uh, current consumption needs, but also their uh, livelihoods productivity as they move forward through the lean season. We do expect that there will be some reprieve in uh, acute food insecurity in the coming months as, as harvests do come in. There are, are some areas, particularly in northern areas and worst affected areas by the drought, where households won't harvest anything. But we are expecting that many rural households will have something to harvest in the coming months and we'll see a, a small decline in the severity of acute food insecurity needs. But as I mentioned before, we're expecting that lean season to start much earlier this year uh, as household stocks uh, deplete much earlier than normal. Uh, additionally, as Jason mentioned, this is not only a, a rural food insecurity issue in Zimbabwe. In urban areas, there is uh, somewhat less of a seasonal trend in acute food insecurity because households are purchasing throughout the year. And as I'm sure many of us have seen in news media and in other reports, uh, there has been at times over the last year or two uh, acute shortages in food uh, Key, key foods uh, available in supermarkets in urban areas of Zimbabwe, and the price shocks are not only related to the key staples uh, that we're seeing acute price shocks, and they're, they're related across all staple needs uh, in Zimbabwe, food and non-food items. And when the urban population go to purchase uh, these goods, particularly the poor urban population, they're faced with reduced purchasing power as their incomes, as we've discussed, are not keeping pace with food price inflation in Zimbabwe. Um, as we move forward into 2000, uh, the end of 2019 and, and early 2020, we are expecting the acute food insecurity need to grow in Zimbabwe. Uh, in 2015-16, following the severe El Nino drought, uh, we saw needs jump to uh, more than 4 million people in need of acute food insecurity uh, by the end of 2016 and early 2017. We don't currently have a projection estimate for the end of this year or as we move into early next year, but given the combined impacts that we talked today about the poor economic crisis, uh, the, the drought that occurred through, throughout much of the region, not just Zimbabwe and also the, the cyclone that passed through, we do expect needs to rise continually as, as we come out of this lean season and move into the, to the early start of the next lean season in the end of this year in September, October and into early 2020. Um, Judd mentioned at the beginning, um, and both of you just touched on it a little bit, bit about the urban versus rural, but I just want to see if there's anything more you want to say, Peter, in terms of the tools. What I mean by that is, do we have the right um, funding uh, and analytical tools, um, focus, I don't even know even mm -hmm. what the right word is, but are we able to track what's happening in the urban environment in terms of inf food insecurity the same as rural, and, and how, what's the difference between that from your perspective? Sure. So um, the typical way that not just fused it, but most country offices analyze acute food insecurity in the context that we work in is, is based off of local expert knowledge of livelihoods and different uh, food consumption patterns in a country. And that's typically our starting point for building uh, our tools to assess the level of acute food insecurity in rural areas. What we're seeing in monitoring of acute food insecurity in urban areas is sharing of tools and experience from not just within a country, but from different regions and different parts uh, of the globe and, and seeing what works well in, in different contexts because while uh, the 30,000 foot glance at urban food, food security makes things look like they're very similar no matter what urban setting you are in. There are very uh, different nuances in, in, in different parts of the country. Things behave differently in Bula Wild than they do in Harare, and, and, you, and we need to not only adapt our tools, but adapt our analysis to that situation. And we're seeing um, as this 
crisis develops in Zimbabwe, lessons learned from other parts of sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world being brought to, to the Zimbabwe context to refine our household survey tools, to refine how we sample uh, households in uh, urban areas, and then also thinking about how we make projections based on the information we collect today. Uh, in acute food insecurity analysis, there are unfortunately not many indicators that tell you about what's gonna happen tomorrow or in six months. Uh, there's a, a, an in-depth analysis process, FuseNet, we use a livelihoods-based approach to analyze how current conditions will evolve in the future um, to, to present uh, or to analyze what outcomes will look like in the future. So it's really a sharing of experiences in sub-Saharan Africa and in, in parts of Asia and how um, surveys are conducted and implemented in other urban areas that are, that are brought to this context to help us better assess uh, acute food insecurity in a context where we're typically more focused on the rural population. Thank you so much. Um, Ashok, you are not a food security expert, which is exactly why we have you at the table. You're the economist and you know Zimbabwe well. Um, Interested in your thoughts, um, particularly on how the U.S. both State Department policy and development humanitarian aid is is helping or um, or hindering efforts, and and what is Zimbabwe doing about this? Please. Well, thank you, Kimberly, and thank you very much to CSIS for inviting me to this important uh, discussion. Um, yeah, I think you've heard from Jason and also from Peter about the humanitarian situation, about the food insecurity situation, and you know the requirements of the population. So my perspective is somewhat different. Um, uh, these are all symptoms of a situation in Zimbabwe which has emerged over the last few years. But we are not going to solve these problems if we continue to try and address them just in terms of humanitarian assistance. We have to move towards solving the, 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 the fundamental underlying problems which the economy face, faces um, in terms of uh, general economic policy reform and also in terms of agricultural policy reform. Uh, unless we do that, we're going to continue to face continually um, situations of food insecurity and the requirement for humanitarian assistance. So my perspective, as I said, is somewhat different. So the first thing I want to say is that um, I think the context is very important. And uh, if the audience does not understand the context, then it will be difficult for me to build the argument. So the old regime of President Mugabe um, was essentially one which believed in the state-led paradigm. Now, there's nothing unusual about it. Most developing countries had that paradigm in the 50s and 60s. But unfortunately, in Zimbabwe, that continued into the 2000s. So this state-led paradigm basically meant over-regulation, uh, controls. We had 114 parastatals all over the economy. And in agriculture, of course, we had a monopoly purchase uh, organization called the Grain Marketing Board. Now, I think the fundamental problem in agriculture was this kind of agricultural policy, because the Grain Marketing Board was the monopoly purchase organization, it fixed prices and provided input subsidies. These prices were not remunerative to the farmer. And besides that, um, they would not even pay the farmers on time. So the consequence was that nobody was really interested in producing maize. So it's not really, it's the incentive systems which in agriculture and agricultural policy which are, which are at fault. Now, unless we under, uh, uh, you know, address these underlying issues relating to agricultural policy, we're going to continue to see these problems that Jason and Peter are referring to. So the question is, is the government of Zimbabwe um, doing anything about it now? Now, what you have to understand is that, to me, there's been a fundamental change in the nature of the government or the orientation of government since the fall of Mugabe. The new government, um, unlike the old government, is not committed and does not subscribe to the state-led paradigm of growth. This is very important to, to, to understand. It, this government is committed to the idea of a market-based economy. Now, I'm not suggesting that it's easy to move from a state-led model to a market-based model. In fact, most of the problems that you have referred to, including, including inflation, are a consequence of the transition that is currently happening. 
Because in the, in the old days, we never had price situations like the one that you're referring to. We just had price controls, simple, <laughs> okay? But now the problem is that we have inflation running at 56% or 66%, unofficially over 100%. It's happening because of the transition from a state-led model, from a state-controlled model, to a market-based model. And this is, the, this is the key to understanding Zimbabwe today. So if we don't understand that, you will see, you cannot understand what, why the situation is what it is um, in the country. Now, let's just have a look at the agricultural sector. So essentially going back, so currently what, what's happening in terms of Zimbabwean policy, the formulation of economic policy, is there's a tug of war between the two sides. We have those people uh, who've been there for the last 40 years, who have a certain model of development, a way of thinking, who believe in controls. And then you have those um, who are supporting the president um, um, and our finance minister. Uh, it's a group which is more committed to economic reform and a market-based system, which is trying to put in place market-based solutions to the problems faced by Zimbabwe. So if you don't understand this, 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 this conflict, you will not understand what is happening in Zimbabwe today. Um, and to me, understanding the most appropriate response from the international community to this situation is an understanding of this conflict which is currently ongoing. Now in the agricultural sector, let me give you an example of the moves that are being made away from the old state-led model. Okay, I'll give you some examples to give you an idea that it's not just hot air that I'm talking about. <laughs> so, in agriculture now, there is a major effort to move towards market-based, private sector-based initiatives. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, in the soya industry, which is very important, um, there's a major in initiative which is now led by the oil, um, the, the, the oil industry, the, 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 the cooking oil industry. It's actually the, 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 the processors who are leading this process. Um, and what they have done is they have actually contracted 10,000 hectares of land um, as, as private contracting, very similar to what happens in the tobacco industry in Zimbabwe to grow soya bean. This is an entirely private sector-led initiative in which they're going to contract these farmers at remunerative prices to grow the soya bean and then buy it back. Private sector-led initiative. I'll give you another example. We have a company that Delta that buys barley. And in fact, it has a similar contract growing scheme for barley growing, almost all the barley growing in Zimbabwe, which is used in beer. Very important. Um, in the dairy sector, all the dairy companies have gotten together with support from the European Union, and they're doing exactly the same thing in the dairy industry. So I can go on like this. There are any number of initiatives. But the point is, this is happening, and there's very little support from the government of Zimbabwe for these initiatives because there's no clarity on agricultural policy. Agricultural policy in one way is still dominated by the old type of thinking. On the other hand, you have all this stuff that is happening in the, in the private sector and nobody is supporting what's happening in the private sector. Um, there are certain initiatives, I am not very familiar with the USAID program, but there are some small initiatives like bananas and other things which USAID is doing. But in the main, all this stuff that's happening in the private sector has no support from anywhere. So what I'm trying to say about the agricultural sector is that, and this is equally true of across the board in the economy, is that there is a lot happening now uh, in terms of private sector initiatives, in terms of move towards market-based reform, but there is almost negligible assistance from the international community to these efforts, either to support uh, a dialogue with the government of Zimbabwe, to facilitate and to, to move these policies in the direction of, uh, uh, of something more stable, um, or sub direct support to the private business community, whether in the agricultural sector or in the industrial sector, to actually further these initiatives. So my perspective on um, um, your, your second question in terms of US government policy is based on this uh, perspective on what is happening in Zimbabwe. So, you know, as Jason has said, uh, the United States is the largest donor to Zimbabwe, $300 million a year, roughly speaking. Most of it goes to health assistance, about 60%, and maybe another 25, 30% goes to humanitarian assistance, food aid, and maybe a 10 odd percent or whatever goes to democracy and governance in human rights issues. So to me, this is all good. And I have no idea what, what restrictions 
Congress or the other authorities put on the programming of USAID assistance. But to me, this is relief assistance. And this does not tackle the fundamental problems of Zimbabwe. So my recommendation would be that, that if one is to move towards a, a self-sustaining solution, a long-term solution to the problems that have been enunciated over here, we have to move away. Of course, humanitarian assistance is important in a crisis situation. But if you do not move your aid program, and that's not just for USAID, that's for all international donors. Uh, it's the same with the British. Uh, they have negligible assistance, uh, no, no assistance to the government. In fact, the only, in, the only donor which has moved away from this model is the European Union. The European Union has now a formal memorandum of understanding um, with the government of Zimbabwe. Um, they still have sanctions, individual sanctions, but that does not mean that they do not have a formal program with the government to actually support long-term sustainable economic growth. So to me, that's the sort of model that needs to be adopted. Now, I think one of the biggest problems that um, um, I don't know, as I said, what programming restrictions USAID has in terms of, of moving in this direction. But if I were responsible for the US government's program, I would move the program almost entirely to in the direction of economic growth. Um, of course, one has to respond to the humanitarian situation as it exists. But if you do not address the economic growth, the policy issues, all we are trying to do is put patches, put bandages. We're not solving the fundamental problem. And in this context, I'd just like to make a remark about Zidera. Um, to me, actually, Zidera is- and Tell uh, us what Zidera means. Uh, yes, Z Zidera is the Zimbabwe economic, um, what is it? <laughs> Uh, democracy this is why and, acronyms uh, are so bad. We never know what they mean, democracy right? And, uh, <laughs> democracy ahead. and? Economic Recovery Act. Right. Zimbabwe Economic and Democracy uh, and Economic Recovery Act. So the impact of Zidera essentially is, um, uh, you have to understand there are two separate uh, sets of measures on Zimbabwe. One is individual sanctions um, on, on, on certain group of people and companies, um, OFAC sanctions, and the other is Zidera, which is an act of Congress. Now, what Zidera does is it actually makes it difficult for uh, Zimbabwe to access new financing from international financial markets. Uh, it's very problematic in that sense. Um, it also requires the United States Executive Director in, on the international financial institutions to, to um, vote against any new aid to Zimbabwe. So, to me, this is very problematic. Of course, it is problematic from the Zimbabwean point of view. But I think that is actually against US interests as well. And what I would like to do is um, I have over here, and I'm going to end with this, I have this speech over here by National Security Advisor Ambassador John Bolton in December 18, um, talking about the Trump administration's new Africa strategy. Yeah? And I believe that the US policy towards Zimbabwe is actually contrary to this document. And it is actually not consistent with the Trump administration's Africa strategy. So very quickly, I'll just read a few things. Firstly, Ambassador Bolton says the strategy addresses three core US interests. The first is advancing US trade and commercial ties with nations. So let's be very clear. Zidera prevents any kind of commercial or trade ties, or rather makes it more difficult for the United States or United States private sector or companies to have, have any trade or commercial ties with Zimbabwe because of the perceived risk, okay? So that's one thing that cannot happen because of Zidera. The second thing that um, Ambassador Bol Bolton mentions is that their policy should be such that it should counter the threat from radical Islam, okay? Now, I won't go into too much detail about this because I'm an economist and I don't, you know, I don't have much, but there have certainly been reports of the movement south of Islamic terrorist groups into Southern Africa. Now, as far as I know, um, the government of Zimbabwe is more than happy and more than willing to cooperate with the United States on this matter. But as far as Zidera in place, it's not going to happen. No cooperation, okay? And the third thing relates to what Ambassador Bolton says is that aid shall be used effectively and efficiently and that relief must lead to reform. This is a key phrase that he has used. And he says, 
billions have been given and they have not been effective, relief must lead to reform. So the way I see it, that the relief program in Zimbabwe that the US government has does not lead to any reform. So you're giving $300 million in aid and there is zero impact on reform because of Zidera. So my recommendation would be that Zidera should actually be suspended or abolished or whatever it is. They should be normalized. I'm not talking about sanctions. See, I'm not saying that there are no human rights problems. I'm not saying that there's no democracy and governance issues. But the other donors, they raise these issues regularly and they dialogue with the government. And they talk about it. So nobody is hiding from these issues. But what I'm saying is that this prevents a proper dialogue between the United States and the government of Zimbabwe and the people of Zimbabwe more importantly. I'm not denying the humanitarian assistance. But in terms of long-term reform, in my opinion, US assistance has got a negligible effect. Thank you. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, I'm going to give Jason a chance to respond. I'm going to have a, a few of my own uh, quick feedback. And then we'll turn to the audience for questions and comments. So do be thinking about uh, what you want to ask our panelists in our, our remaining 25 minutes. Um, first, Jason, you know, his point about relief must be to reform. I have to, of course, think about we do a lot of work here uh, with USAID. And full disclosure, I used to work for USAID. So I follow it closely with, with Mark Green's new journey to self-reliance, with the new USAID strategy on private sector, with Feed the Future. Um, I know you're more of the humanitarian person, but you certainly are well aware of all of that. How does that feed into what he's talking about and other thoughts um, to his remarks? Yeah. Um, it, it, I'll address the, the, the sanctions issue first. I mean, you, you're right uh, when you mentioned Zadera does exist. Um, it's also true to say that it's never been implemented. Uh, Zadera only comes into effect in the case that Zimbabwe clears all of its arrears to the international financial, financial institutions. That's, that's the point at which a Zaderic discussion can even begin. And so the idea that Zadera is ruining the trade and investment climate in Zimbabwe is simply not true. Um, regarding the other sanctions, around 86 individuals have been sanctioned. About 56 institutions have been sanctioned. The majority of those institutions are either owned or operated by the individuals. These are individual targeted sanctions. So there's nothing in Zadera, nor is there anything in the individual and targeted sanctions that prohibits investment in Zimbabwe. I would argue what prohibits investment in Zimbabwe is a lack of economic reform, a lack of property rights, the lack of uh, secure investment climate, and the lack of uh, a political and human rights context that businesses appreciate. I think to point to sanctions is to create a straw man and destroy that straw man and do nothing about the root causes that you're addressing. Ashok, you mentioned the different pillars of, of the Trump uh, Africa strategy. In terms of US trade and commercial ties, you say that that's impossible under Zadera. We have Skechers in Zimbabwe. We have Western Union in Zimbabwe. We have Pizza Hut in Zimbabwe. We have investors to Zimbabwe who come, take a look, and then some invest because the conditions are appropriate, and some do not. Not because of Zadera, but because of these other elements. Radical Islam. Effective aid and efficiency. Um, I, I think that this is, this is something that, that's important to keep in mind. R relief must lead to reform. I, I think that we're sort of, it's true that our relief is only sustainable if reforms take place. I, I think though that uh, we're, we're sort of reversing the, the, the causality between assistance and reform. We have an investment climate, we have as a US government that relies upon the government's ability to reform itself. It's not for us to reform it. Relief leads to reform in the sense that the government itself is able to create the change necessary. Just improving our engagement um, will not necessarily lead to reform unless there's a tangible will on the part of the government to undertake those reforms. And I would say that uh, we, let's not imply that we're not engaged with the government. Uh, we've had, uh, over the last several years, uh, a, a significant economic research uh, activity that I know you're very familiar with that provided a lot of meaningful analysis to government to assist in their decision making. That's all gathering dust on a shelf. 
we had the Lima process, uh, which was supposed to identify the roadmap um, that Zimbabwe would follow, um, that was agreed upon in 2015, that would one day lead to the ability for Zimbabwe to withdraw money from the international financial institutions. Zimbabwe is defected from that. And so the idea that increased engagement is necessary for reform is simply not correct. We have been engaging on every level for years. Um, the fact that in, the answer to engagement is more engagement and then we'll have reform, that, that just does, that's just not logical. And so I, I think that we need to be clear um, that these problems, I, and I agree with you, that these problems are, are going to take a while to uh, climb their way, for Zimbabwe to dig its way out of. Um, and I know that there's a tension between the old state-led paradigm and the new market-based paradigm, but it's not for the United States to go into the internal workings of a government and somehow make the reformers win. Um, that's not what we're about. We're about setting the standard and waiting for Zimbabwe to meet that standard. And with that moment comes more substantive engagement. We are doing everything we can by law. You, you mentioned that you're not sure what we can do given the sanctions. We can do a lot of things. The only thing we can't really do is give directly to the government, which we don't do in most cases anyway. And so our engagement on a sector by sector level in Zimbabwe is not terribly different than it is in any other country uh, where the US government is present and USAID has activities. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that we can't do anything because of sanctions is just not true. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I often say panels are really boring when we all agree. So thank you for not making our panel boring this morning because people don't agree. And that's, that's important to see those different perspectives. Um, I'd like to turn to the audience now. Please raise your hand. We'll, we'll take probably a round of three or four. We'll start in the back, back there, um, right next to Kat. And if you could um, please state your name and affiliation and stand for our online audience. Thank you so much. And please don't make, uh, you're not a, a fourth speaker, so please go straight to a question or a comment. Go ahead. Sure, thanks. Uh, my name is Todd Moss. I'm a longtime Zimbabwe watcher, yeah. former State Department official. Thank you for, for holding this, uh, this great event. Um, <clears throat> Jason, you painted a pretty dire picture, you know, somewhere between three and five million Zimbabweans. Just a few months ago, uh, Joe Mutizwa testified to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as an unofficial envoy for President Monongagwa that there was no agricultural crisis at all, uh, that the strategic gra grain reserve was full, and anyone saying that there's food insecurity in Zimbabwe was lying. I can show you the testimony if you want to see it. Um, one thing we did not hear, you know, it's very passive language. Zimbabwe is running out of um, food. There's a macro crisis. Um, the climate shocks are, are affecting the country. One thing we didn't hear about is command agriculture. The agriculture minister is the former general, um, and um, he is on the U.S. sanctions list for a very particular reason. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any comment on whether command agriculture uh, is part of the food problem. Uh, Ashok um, made some excellent points about the need for market reforms. Um, how, um, however, I think this narrative that there's a tug of war and that um, Emerson Monongagwa is the good guy and the reformer is totally false. That is the, that is the narrative the government's putting out there. Uh, the finance minister, very well respected person. He's got the SMP now with the IMF. He's, he's tightening fiscal policy. But as Ambassador Harrington said in his opening statement, um, Zimbabwe's fundamental problem is political this situation will not be resolved by tightening fiscal policy, as important as that, as that might be. Um, and this gets down to really um, uh, whether the government is a reformist government or not, or is it more like a military junta, where you have a former general as the agriculture minister, um, and you know, Ashok, I know you know the economy very well. We know who is controlling, for instance, all the fuel imports. Um, which belies this narrative that the government is, is really a reformist uh, government. So I, I'd be interested in that. Um, and just one last point, I, I think you didn't only get the acronym wrong for Zadera, but the content as well. Jason was actually, I think, uh, very diplomatic. Um, but the idea that there are trade sanctions as part of Zadera makes absolutely no sense. And the, the reason that Zimbabwe cannot borrow is because it has not paid its debts since uh, 2001. And that is the reason uh, that it ha doesn't have access to credit. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. I've been reading you for years, so thanks for coming and excellent comments. Let's come over here. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, Franklin, go ahead. Thank you, Franklin Moore, Africare. Um, I'll be brief, very brief. <laughs> It's okay, Todd. You know the subject matter. It's all right. Frankly, go ahead. So um, this is probably more for Jason and Peter, although I'd like to hear from Ashok as well. Um, I find it interesting that you, in talking about the setting in Zimbabwe, did not talk at all about the diaspora or remittances. And you know, Zimbabwe is kind of unique in terms of those who have left the country, and you have such a large portion of the population that is literally hugging the borders and returning home with some regularity. So I would like to hear a little bit about how that figures into particularly the situation now, but also the longer term situation. Thanks, Franklin. More questions? I'd like to get a female in the audience. Dina? Sorry, we have a lot of male speakers today. We gotta switch it up a little bit. Hi, Dina Esposito with Mercy Corps. Uh, a couple of questions uh, that are maybe a little bit more in the weeds on the response options for the growing hunger crisis. We talked about the rising food prices and how acute they are. We have a lot of people who are hungry in urban areas. The natural response in the humanitarian community, especially for urban re uh, responses, are to do cash-based programming. And I'm just wondering uh, what FuseNet or AID is thinking about in terms of mitigating hunger without exacerbating inflation or um, just d having a very inefficient program where we're giving people more and more money to buy things that are more and more expensive. So, uh, and my second question is, how does the shift in AID's Bureau for Food Security become Bureau for Resilience and Food Security affect your thinking, if at all, in what the resilience agenda should be in Zimbabwe, given the conditions you've, con you've described? Thanks. That was one of my questions, too. We'll take one more. You'll get it. And then, and then we'll turn to you guys. And Ashok, we'll start with you for responses and kind of go down uh, to respond to anything that they're talking with. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Larry, Larry Schaefer with uh, Schaefer Global. For uh, Mr. Ashok, the uh, private sector um, projects that have been going on, you mentioned that uh, there should be or there w could be some better support systems or mechanisms in place. If you could speak more to what those would look like to really enhance potential new projects stepping in to the marketplace. And if you could speak to also infrastructure um, in forms of transportation, power, communications, um, those infrastructures, what is prohibited for development of private sector projects in the rural areas as well as in the urban areas um, for production and taking things to market. Thank you so much. So um, we have about 15 minutes. I'm gonna let you guys go down. Um, take your time in responding, maybe two to four minutes and respond to any question you want as well as any other additional thoughts and then we'll see what time we have left. Ashok, go ahead. Backwards in terms of the questions, because I think the one from my colleague there is the most difficult one. <laughs> so in terms of mechanisms for support, as I give you an example, the EU is already has a program to support the dairy and livestock sector. This is entirely a private sector initiative, which is controlled by uh, the major milk processors, uh, including Nestle's. And uh, they have a program in which they, I think they're, I'm not that familiar, I just have a general idea, but they're supporting a lot of uh, inputs such, such, such as Haifa cows, et cetera, to increase the breeding stock, uh, plus other veterinarian services, et cetera. So they're providing the technical support to the, 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 the uh, milk producers to assist smallholder farmers to come out with some kind of a scheme. So I think that that can be replicated. Uh, by the way, Zimbabwe has an extremely successful contract farming model for tobacco. And uh, last year, we had the highest level of tobacco ever produced. Uh, it is primarily produced by smallholders, and it is private sector-led. Um, you have external buyers who come in and finance the, the crop, and then it is re-bought by them, or it goes through the tobacco auction floors. So this, this model is, quite, uh, is one which can, can be replicated across the private sector in many areas, particularly agriculture. So that's one area. Infrastructure, the, the government has now put in place uh, a, a public-private partnership policy. Um, and there are many projects where uh, investors are coming in. Uh, the latest one, there's some on roads, 
Um, the latest one relates to our major border post between Zimbabwe and South Africa. Most of our trade goes through there and it's very problematic, lots of corruption, uh, leakages. Um, it's being privatized so that it's actually going to be a public-private partnership that runs the border post. I don't know what the commercial arrangement is, but it's going to be a private sector initiative. Uh, likewise, in the power sector, this policy is being furthered and there are many investors which are looking at private power plants. Of course, there are pro problems of payment. Um, the, the, the electricity undertaking isn't exactly in a very solvent situation, so that's going to affect uh, uh, any investor, but certainly uh, solar plants are coming up in certain areas which will supply the grid, and they are 100% owned by the private sector. So that's sort of, uh, but, the, but the, the legal framework is in place for that kind of initiative. Um, in terms of diaspora remittances, very important. Um, uh, in fact, it's about a billion dollars that comes through the official system, and I suspect probably another billion dollars unofficially. Um, uh, I think the government recognizes the importance, and many of us have been arguing that there should be a specific diaspora policy, uh, as exists in many other countries, to encourage uh, such flows. At the moment, the government does not really have any specific diaspora policy or give any special incentives. But it's certainly being looked at, and uh, we, we, we certainly want such, some such policy to be put in place. Uh, coming back to my friend over here, I think the question is not whether Manangagwa is a good guy or a bad guy. That's not the relevant point. Uh, uh, the point here is, the question is whether policy reform is happening in Zimbabwe or not. And I am quite happy to sit with you and tell you exactly what is happening in each sector. And many of these, um, and I'm sorry, I, I think that you're ill-informed if you think that reform is not happening, okay? Um, it, it, I don't have the time, but I can go across the board in terms of what is happening. Um, the, the point, fundamental point is that we had a state-led model, and that model is no longer the philosophy of this government. I'm not denying that there's so many things wrong with Zimbabwe. Okay, nobody's denying that the army should not be on the streets. We accept all of that. The question is, what's the direction of change? And if there is a certain direction of change, which I am convinced about, sitting there, okay, then that direction of change should be supported. Because if you don't support that direction of, of change, you are actually inadvertently supporting the other side. And that's the reality of Zidera. Zidera, indeed, it, I don't agree with Jason, does make a difference to trade and commercial uh, flows, not legally. This is you know, so easy to talk about it. International markets don't necessarily work purely in terms of the, 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 the laws in place. Perception is terribly important. I'll give you an example. Uh, GE was in Zimbabwe a few months ago, big power sector. And they were interested in coming in and they have their own financing. And they came and they had a look, and they didn't like the idea. Partially, of course, yes, it is true that we don't have the best investment climate, but work is being done on that investment climate. But they didn't come in because of the perceived risk of Zidera. And that's the reality. And if you think Zidera doesn't affect people, let me tell you my own experience. I have a daughter who studies in the United States. I made a transfer to her last year, 4,000 bucks, and it was blocked. Not Zidera, but because of OFAC because the correspondent bank saw Zimbabwe written over there and blocked this transfer for her fees. I have all the papers. You're shaking your head. It's a fact. Come and talk to me, okay? <laughs> right. And I'll give you more. You think that Zidera doesn't make a difference? Some years ago, we had about 40 correspondent banks which dealt with Zimbabwe. It's a fact that there are only about a half a dozen correspondent banks that are willing to deal with Zimbabwe now because of the perceived risk. It has nothing to do with whether there's a you know, specific law in place. Do you think Deutsche Bank or UBS will take the risk of dealing with Zimbabwe, which is a, for small time transactions, you know, when you have this big United States Zidera on top? The answer is no. So this is a reality, and I think it's about time that you should get your facts. I'm quite happy to enlighten you in terms of across the board what is happening, and uh, you know, we can take it from there. Now, the last point I relate, uh, uh, talk about is command agriculture. You're absolutely right about command agriculture. Command agriculture was a natural outcome of the state-led model. 
the idea that there was market failure in agriculture and therefore it had to be taken over by the state. But I've just given you private sector initiatives which are trying to move into that space, firstly. And secondly, there is acceptance in the government of Zimbabwe, and if you look at the budget also, there is acceptance that the command agriculture model is not the appropriate model and it is certainly not affordable for Zimbabwe. There's no specific budget allocation for command agriculture. It was all off budget when it happened the last time. And if the finance minister is serious about controlling the budget deficit and he's serious about his job, there's not going to be off budget expenditure this year. So yes, command agriculture was a solution of those people who felt that you had to have food security based on the intervention of the state. But that's not the model anymore. And that's not the way that agriculture is going to be dealt with going forward. But it needs the support of the international community to get these initi initiatives to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peter. I might start by picking up on the resilience question. As Ashok mentioned, or not resilience, excuse me, remittances question. As Ashok mentioned, uh, remittances are certainly a very important source of income for many Zimbabweans uh, throughout the year. Uh, I think one thing to note in particular is, um, and I don't have figures on this, but I would, I would assume remittances also play a key role in the liquidity uh, crisis ongoing in Zimbabwe. And um, not just this year, but over the last few years at FuseNet, we've been monitoring prices, particularly in border areas, not only in US dollars or bond note equivalents, but also in RAND, in mobile money, and other currencies, uh, because we know the importance that remittances play uh, for household incomes coming into Zimbabwe, but at the same time, the importance that that currency that comes into Zimbabwe also plays in the broader economic uh, scheme in Zimbabwe. And I think this folds maybe a little bit into to Dina's question as well on um, cash-based programming considerations to make. I'll admit that I haven't been part of the conversation on uh, response options in Zimbabwe at the moment, but I think uh, two things um, that I hope are being discussed are uh, what are the lessons learned that we have from contexts like Nigeria a couple years ago when caste based programming was implemented amongst an economic climate where food prices were continuing to increase. Uh, this was more of an external shock with oil prices driving up food prices in Nigeria. but. Um, implementing a cash-based program in a context where prices are not fluctuating from month to month, but from, from week to week in markets when uh, food baskets for those, those cash interventions are set um, at a less frequent basis. And then also thinking about um, what types of cash or cash equivalents are used in different contexts across Zimbabwe. Uh, dollars and bond note equivalents are maybe the most predominant, but not the most predominant everywhere in, in Zimbabwe, particularly as you get to some border areas of, of the country. So can you turn off your microphone as well? You too, Peter. Thanks. Jason, responses and final word? Yeah, um, just to, to the question on command and agriculture, I, I agree with what, what Ashok said. I think a broader interesting point on that, um, you know, government can't spend off budget, and so that's 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 a bottom line. But but that said, I've seen a pattern of government investments in a lot of things that, that seem to make sense. I mean, when you look at the input supply schemes or food deficit mitigation programs, but all these programs, although the, the expenditure is large, um, I, I feel like the programs individually are, are not as efficient as they could be. So I, I think Zimbabwean, Zimbabweans, they, they're actually de facto entitlement programs that don't work very well. Um, and so I, I think if government of Zimbabwe is going to move to an on-budget sort of entitlement frame, um, which again, they need to make the room for that, um, I, I think that they, they shouldn't follow patterns like the, the command agriculture command agricultural program or the presidential input supply scheme. I, I think there are better ways to structure these things. And so I, I think there's some value left on the table despite the government's best efforts to, to meet some needs. Um, I, I, think, I think the diaspora question has, has, been, has been answered. Um, in terms of, Dina, your questions on cash-based programming, yeah, um, I, even in spite of these issues that we're talking about now, our, our programming in the rural areas is largely cash-based um, currently. Um, and so I, and we are in constant communication with the World Food Program on their sort of real-time market analysis to make sure that we are staying within what is um, efficient for cash-based programming. And I'm happy to say that so far so good, although this is something that we're, we're, we're looking at and, and we don't know how long it's going to continue. Um, in urban areas, it, it's interesting uh, because we, we talk about that 1.5 million needs figure. It 
although I think that's a solid estimate, it cries out for further analysis in terms of what's driving those needs and how to subcategorize caseloads within that 1.5. I, I think that there's a percentage of those people uh, that are transitory food insecure that need some sort of direct relief to, to make it to tomorrow, but I think there are other chronic drivers for other uh, members of that caseload uh, that could be tied to access to basic services and other economic drivers. Um, and so I think that um, to go in and say, all right, guns blazing, 1.5 million ca in cash people to receive cash transfers, go. I, I think that would sort of um, lose some of the necessary nuance. And I know that um, you know, DFID and World Food Program and USAID, we are collaboratively uh, analyzing these needs and trying to work with the government of Zimbabwe uh, in a um, to, to better address them, uh, but I, our learning, we're low on the learning curve still. Um, we're, we are uh, working on it continuously though. Um, in terms of um, the resilience agenda, I, I think that it, it, certainly in Zimbabwe there's a focus on areas of recurrent crisis, and I think that's, that's shared both on the, uh, the ag agricultural development side and the food for peace side. I, I think we're sort of converging. Zimbabwe is a country of recurrent crisis, and so we have to operate and design with that in mind, I think. Um, and that's what we're doing currently. I think in terms of what we're doing well and, and other areas where we have some things to learn, I, I think what we've, what I mentioned earlier, these resilience capacities among Zimbabweans themselves. They're largely social. Uh, they're able to rely on one another. There's a sense of psychological safety. Um, and I think that uh, we've done statistical analysis and, and um, qualitative analysis that shows that elements of psychological safety within a community are more significant drivers of resilience building even than livelihood diversification, which is the stock and trade of our resilience programming. So this suggests to me that Although we're not doing the wrong thing in terms of our resilience approaches, we have a lot to learn. And, and, so, and I think that um, what we're talking about here is addressing exactly what's going wrong in, in Zimbabwe rural and urban areas. We're seeing um, a degradation of the social fabric. And so I think resilience programming has to address that um, in order to be successful. And I think that we have, have a lot of learning as USAID so far in collaboration with organizations like yours and, and others in this room today. Um, so it, it's a shared effort. Um, and I think just, you know, finally, I, I, I just, if I can sort of close real quick, um, just with a quick story. Um, a few years ago, my, my daughter and I were in Mbari Market when we could, when we could still go there, um, just looking for arts and crafts, right? Um, and my daughter found, she was three at the time, she found a little rattle, like a baby rattle. It was not well made, but it was specifically made. It was, it was, just, it was, it was not a lovely thing, but it was pink. And so I bought it because she wanted it. Um, and I thought to, I remember looking at, looking at it and thinking, well, who made this? Like, someone made this. It's not particularly well made. It's in this corner of this place. Like, wh why does this thing exist, you know? Like, who's making money off of this? Fast forward a couple of years to that conflict assessment I was talking about. I was sitting with a colleague in Epworth, and we were talking to a household about their needs, and this was back in November. Um, and I noticed the woman, it was a woman, and she was, you know, talking to us, and she had all of the input. She was making those things. She was making those rattles. And I don't know if she was the only one, but the color was the same. Like she was, she was sitting there making it, and we were asking her about it. She said, "Yeah, uh, you know, I do a lot of different things. I make a few cents for each one that I that I sell to the market." And I thought, I found the lady. I found the reason that these things exist. And this woman, um, who was by all accounts very vulnerable, she um, had, and she told us her story. Years ago, she had a poultry business um, that was viable. Um, she was successful. It was you know, small, but, but, but viable. And her daughter wanted to go to university, and she didn't have enough capital. So she ended up selling her business. She sold all of her, her stock. She sold her other things to, to fund her daughter to go to university. Unfortunately, her daughter is still not employed, and the economic downturn meant that she couldn't reinvest that capital. And so, again, strategic suboptimization. She, she did something um, that helped um, achieve one goal at the expense of another, and she was trying to cobble things together. And, and here she was sitting there, and she was very much the picture of, of a vulnerable household. Female-headed, the, the, her husband was out of the picture. She had a number of children, one of whom was an adult, a, a, adult man. Um, <laughs> adult man, redundant, um, who was a, an adult son uh, who had f sev a severe disability. Um, he uh, hadn't used, didn't have the use of his arms, had difficulty walking, um, and yet she was talking about him and showing us how he could 
use his toes to tap on a Nokia headset, handset to um, send a text. And she was saying, surely, surely there's a place for him. Surely we can, he can be productive. Surely we can find him a job, maybe in computer science. And it was so striking that in the face of this woman's difficulties, um, she wasn't complaining. She was looking for the next opportunity, not only for herself, but for her disabled son. And so I, I think we talk about these needs, this, the, these large numbers of needs, these caseloads, as being a burden, but it's not a burden. These people are Zimbabwe's greatest opportunity. And it's by taking that opportunity to them to help them in building their own self-reliance that we're gonna be that bottom-up transformation. We're gonna be the reform um, as a result of the assistance. And so I, I think we mustn't lose sight of that fact. Zimbabwe, we're, we've sort of beaten that country up today, uh, but really that country has everything it needs to lift itself up by the bootstraps if only you look at it from the right way perception. So I, I'm hoping if you get nothing else from anything I've said, it's a sense of optimism in spite of the, the dire circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That was a beautiful story and a great way to end. Um, and, and although, as you said, Zimbabwe is a country of recurrent crises, I think the reason Judd and I wanted to do this today was to really point out um, the crises it's going through at the moment, and that whether you are interested in this from the angle of U.S. Africa policy or development, humanitarian, you know, food security, hunger, um, that this should be on your radar and should be on other people's radar. So my sort of task to you is see who else you can get um, this on their radar. Um, I'd like to thank Judd and Kat from our Africa program for being great collaborators on this, uh, especially thank our speakers, um, um, certainly those that have traveled all this way. I'd also like to thank, I know we have a, a large online audience that watches us, um, and our audience today, um, you asked very thought-provoking and helpful questions to, to continue to keep us to think about this. So thank you all very much.